My name is Chiamaka, also known as Chi Chi, and I am a 2017-2018 Fulbright Scholar as well as a Belgian American Educational Foudation Fellow. I will be working at the Deduve Institute in Brussels under Dr. Jean-Francois Collet's guidance, uh, where I will be studying uh, protective stress responses of the cell envelope in Escherichia coli or E. coli. Um, essentially, I'm interested in understanding how um, e. coli are able to uh, uh, thwart antibiotic treatment and how they develop antibiotic resistance. So I'll be studying one of the pathways linked to that. So I'm making this video, I'm going to try <laughs> to make it brief, this is like my third time recording this, um, but uh, quite a few people have asked me about um, applying for a Fulbright, how to get abroad, um, what was my experience applying, um, and any tips that I can provide. So I'm going to do my best to condense this, but give you all of the necessary information that you need. So, number one. Find out if your institution has a fellowships office or a Fulbright advising office. I can speak on behalf of the University of Michigan. They do. So if you go to the University of Michigan, go blue, um, just Google Fulbright U of M, sign up for the listserv, go to the advising um, hours, go to the seminars, etc. Find out if your institution has one. Two. Start talking to people about what you want to do, whatever it is. If you know it's a Fulbright, if you know you want to go abroad, talk to your advisors, talk to your PIs, talk to your mentors, talk to your friends, your colleagues, your peers, people who are doing what you're doing or people who are established in their careers. You never know what they know, how they can help you or how they can lead you to someone who can help you. Um, and then the third thing is, I would say, settling on a country. I think that's one of the most challenging parts of the application is finding an affiliate mentor. So essentially, you have to have someone who's willing to sponsor your application, not necessarily financially, but saying, you know, so I support so and so working on my lab under the fellowship under this grant. We'll provide the resources in the lab space for her to conduct her project and blah, blah, blah. Um, so basically finding your mentor abroad and getting them to write a letter of support for you. Um, then, what else? Yeah, those are the main things. So once you kind of have an idea of where you want to apply, uh, which country you want to apply, that's another thing. So you can only apply to one country per cycle. So pick your country, wherever your affiliate's going to be. Um, and then get started writing immediately. Um, it's about, what, it's mid-July, so I guess the application deadline is sometime the first week of October. It's not too late, you can start now if you want to apply for the 2018-2019 cycle, um, but ASAP, like ASAP. So just start writing, even if it's trash, even if it's garbage, even if you don't know if it makes sense, you will thank yourself in the long run because it just allows you to get the ball rolling. Um, if you have a Fulbright advising office at your institution, um, if they do offer an internal campus interview or an internal deadline, which will usually be several weeks before the actual deadline, absolutely, 1,000% do it. Take it seriously. Treat it as if it's the Fulbright interviewing you. Treat it as if you can get eliminated. Even, even though you can't, at least for U of M, you cannot get in, in eliminated through the internal deadline. But I do think it's um, something that can help your application. It may not hurt, but I, I definitely do think it's something that can help you. Um, and then lastly, of course, well, maybe not lastly, but send out drafts to everyone. Um, I sent drafts to my advisors, old advisors, professors, uh, colleagues, postdocs, my mom, who's in academia. Um, but the more eyes you get on it, the better. Maybe not every single draft, but maybe the first draft, maybe the middle and the final. Um, and then most importantly, believe in yourself. Have confidence. Um, Tell yourself you can do it, tell yourself you can deserve it, that you deserve it, and, and remind yourself that while whatever it is you're applying for, you'd be blessed and lucky and fortunate to have that fellowship or that grant, um, there is equally lucky to have you a part of the program. You have something to offer. Um, so make sure that's, that's uh, reflected in your statements that, you know, I'll benefit from this program because of XYZ, um, but I'm also an asset to your program because your mission aligns with my passions, et cetera, et cetera, things of that nature. So those are the first tips that I can think of. Um, hopefully your institution has a, an advising office. And if they don't, check your undergrad in, undergraduate institution as well. You might be able to apply through their office or, yeah, their fellowship office as an alumna. Um, so I know also Michigan offers that as well. 
Um, okay, so I think I've covered the most important things, just kind of like quick tips. So let me briefly tell you about my personal experience applying for the Fulbright Grant. Um, so I applied I for the student U.S. Student Research Grant um, in a broad and broadly in biology. Um, specifically, my training is in biochemistry, uh, X-ray crystallography, molecular biology, and, and, and cloning and studying antibiotic resistance. Um, so about a year ago, I knew that I wanted to find a way to go abroad. I had no idea how I was going to do that. And so I went to the Career Center looking for jobs in consulting. Um, I mentioned that I, I would prefer to be in a job related to research, but if not, I was, I, you know, the, pri the pri primary goal was to go abroad and into a French-speaking country. Um, they recommended that I go to the International Institute of Education at U of M um, and, you know, maybe set up an advising appointment. So on a whim, I just walked over there and luckily there was an advisor open who sat down and told me about the Fulbright Fellowship um, after explaining to him what I wanted to do. Um, so when he described the grant to me, I was like, dude, this is, like, if I were a fellowship, I would be a Fulbright, like, legit. Um, I'm about cultural, promoting cultural ex exchange, meeting new people, learning new languages, uh, living abroad while continuing to do science and doing something that's going to benefit um, society. So once I found out about that, I was like, all right, let's do it. I'm applying. Um, I spoke with some people in the lab and they said, you know, you should, you should talk to our advisor. He's, he, you know, he'll have some resources for you. So I told him. Um, yeah, I want to go to abroad, and at the time I was interested in Paris, and he told me, you know, I don't really know anyone in France, but I can connect you with people who may know some people, and I can also share a list of, of people that I personally know in Europe that, in, in their research, and you can see if, if it interests you. And so that's how I was put in contact with my current uh, mentor abroad, Dr. Jean-Francois Collet. And, um, you know, so my advisor put us in contact uh, via email, and then it was up to me to essentially um, have an informal, very, very informal Skype interview just to explain why I wanted to work in his lab and why I was applying for the fellowship and things of that nature. And he was more than happy to support my application, which was really great and exciting. And so when I told my advisor, he was like, yeah, it's a great environment, it's a super supportive lab, you're going to love the country, you're going to love the city. And so I did more research about the country as well, um, and coincidentally met a uh, engineer who lived in Brussels for four years working for PNG, and he absolutely loved it. He had nothing but wonderful things to say about the country, and particularly because he was a black man in engineering, I really appreciated his perspective because I knew that I could fit in as well as an underrepresented minority, and so that was kind of the icing on the cake. And so I said, all right, I made up my mind. At that point, I was like, okay, great lab, great environment, research related to my, my interests. I can come up with my own proposal. The country's great. They speak French. Like, this literally has all of the things that I need. So let's get started. Um, so then the next thing that I did was start working on my statement of grant purpose. So your statement of grant purpose, I think I mentioned um, earlier, is, you know, essentially you're writing about your research, your timeline. And so I broke it down into, first I kind of provided background information about the project, why it's important, why I had to do it at that lab, specifically um, why it couldn't be done anywhere else, why I needed to work on it. I also discussed my qualifications, um, how I was prepared to do an accelerated project in a short amount of time, etc. Um, and so I, I worked on that mainly with my affiliate mentor since I would be using his resources and, and their data. So he helped me with that statement and then once we had a final working draft I sent that to my advisor at my institution. Then I worked on my personal statement and I knew that would be a little bit easier for me. That was more of my autobiography, my motivation for wanting to go abroad, for doing the things that I do. And so I drew from, you know, my, my um, uh, essays for my applications to graduate school for that. So those were like a really good foundation and made it a lot easier for me to to write my personal statement. And so again I sent my first drafts to a lot of people, to uh, my advisor, uh, friends in the lab, my mom, old employees, colleagues, current Fulbrighters, past Fulbrighters, advising office. I sent it to several people the first draft then, you know, a few people for the, the sixth draft and then the final draft, again, I sent to, to my main contacts. 
Um, I then went through the campus interview, which, funny story, I almost didn't go to because I just felt my drafts weren't where I wanted them to be. But I was like, oh, what the heck, it's, it's meant to help me and constructive feedback would be amazing, you know, would be extremely helpful for me for the, for the application. So I went in, assuming, you know, I, I treated it very seriously, dressed in business, business clothes, um, you know, was prepared to discuss every aspect of my application. And honestly, I'm, I'm, it, it, it was extremely helpful. And I believe that the campus interview cannot, actually, I know for a fact, the campus interview cannot hurt you in the sense that you can't be eliminated. Um, but I do think it can help you. I, I, I do think that maybe maybe there's an avenue for them to relay, um, you know, some of the positive feedback from the interview to the commission or the screening committee. I'm honestly not really sure if, if the university endorses certain applications, but I got the vibe that, you know, maybe it won't hurt, but it can definitely help. It can improve your chances of winning. I could be wrong. Don't quote me on that. But that's just the vibe I got. So campus interview went wonderfully. It was great. Um, they, you know, they just asked me questions. I, I went in there. One thing, you know, one piece of, my, of, of advice my mom always gives me when I get nervous about presentations or anything. She's like, you know, don't worry about trying to sound smart. You are smart. They just want to know what you've been doing. You know, if you have a research presentation, nobody knows what you've been doing in the lab. Nobody knows what your master's thesis is on. Nobody knows what you do every day. This is your opportunity to tell people what you've been doing for the past two years. Same with the Fulbright. You know, the, you know I, I had a, a diverse group of people on the panel, a doctor, an uh, anthropologist, a historian, uh, PhDs, and, and staff, you know, just a, a broad group to, to represent what the, what the um, Fulbright interviewers may be. And she was saying, just talk about your project. They just want to know that you know what you're talking about, that you're qualified, and that you're capable, and that's it. So I went in with that attitude, prepared to um, defend my project, to you know ass ass assert that I am capable and what I'm proposing is feasible, uh, necessary, and needs to be done in Belgium in the lab that I'm going to. Um, so that went really well. If y'all have questions, by the way, if I'm not going into enough detail about certain things, feel free to leave a comment or con contact me directly and I'll, and I'll make a more in-depth video. Um, so then after the campus interview continued, you know, I incorporated the feedback that I received, sent out more drafts, and then finally submitted on October 10th. I believe the official deadline was the 11th, um, but, I, but whatever the deadline was, I submitted a full 24 hours before. Um, so, or maybe even two days before, um, just to avoid any technical difficulties or whatever. So submit your application early. Um, and then I heard back about making it to semifinals in January, January 17th, I believe. Excuse me. Then I was emailed in February. Yes, February, mid-February for an interview with the Fulbright Commission in Brussels, so an in-country interview. Um, and then I was notified that I was selected as a finalist in the beginning of March. Um, so, yeah, that was essentially, um, yeah, that was the whole process. Um, now, the second fellowship that I'm going on, the BAEF fellowship, I learned about from my affiliate mentor, actually. I was so determined, like I mentioned, you know, and I, and I was, and I meant it when I said it, that I truly felt that the Fulbright literally defined me as a person. I was so determined to get abroad. I was like, if this is not for me, if this is not my time, I must go. Like I, you know, the fire had been ignited. I was excited. I found a lab, a great country, a great mentor. And so he actually told me about the BAEF fellowship and told me to apply. So that deadline was in October? end of October um, and then I was actually notified about um, receiving that award before I found out about the uh, uh, Fulbright so um, yeah I was elated <laughs> um, you know I knew regardless that I was I was moving to Belgium and so um, I can't stress the importance of talking to people networking um, and and just starting you know even if you don't know if the first step you're taking is the right one or if it's strong enough or high enough or whatever just just start and keep an open mind um, and be positive and you know affirm that you're capable you're qualified and you're talented and all of the things all of the things um, so that is my Fulbright journey uh, I will definitely be posting more videos about preparing to move abroad preparing to transition into a new country and, and start a new research project 
Um, that'll either be a vlog or a blog, but time will tell. But hopefully um, y'all found this video interesting and informative. Um, and if you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to ask or comment. I will be more than happy to answer them. But just know that if I can do it, so can you. Just get started. It's not too late. If you're thinking about applying this cycle, go for it. Like I, I'm pretty sure I started end of June last year. But now that I think about it, yeah, it was July when I started preparing because I did that after my first lab meeting, but before my first committee meeting. And I think my first lab meeting was sometime in July. So yeah, I, st I started, I really started like for real, for real, like getting put in contact with my affiliate like in July. So if you're thinking about applying for the 2018-2019 cycle, I support it and you got this. Alright, I am heading out. I think this video is too long, so I will chat with y'all later. Alright, bye! Thanks for watching. Like, comment, and subscribe. Until next time.